Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this year's uh, First Asian Housing Conference of 2021. My name is Morgan Anderson, and I work for uh, Poids de Gujing, Niaging Advisory Services out of uh, Fort Francis. We uh, service seven uh, First Nation communities around the area. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jonathan Gregg today. Jonathan Gregg leads the technical department at the Independent First Nations Alliance as the technical service manager. He provides technical advisory service in different capacities on capital projects by reviewing engineering studies and reports, construction documents, and financial reports. In his previous position at OFNTSC, he provided housing inspections for code compliance and advised First Nation communities on ISC reporting requirements. CAMS, housing reports, ONM reports, and the National Reporting Guide. He also has managerial and business experience from working as a project manager in, numer manager in numerous roles. Jonathan is from Lac Sewell First Nation and currently resides in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Throughout his career, he has strived to provide support and help First, First Nation communities build capacity. I'd like to turn it over to Jonathan Gray right now. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for logging in. As uh, Morgan gave me my uh, career history, it's always weird I find it here someone talk about you. But um, one of the things we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about going to, uh, housing housing inspections and having uh, that data being available to uh, housing managers uh, across Canada. Um, you know, I just like to say, you know, one of the things that I always found is we all know that uh, some of from the opening comments that housing is an important matter in our communities. We all know that there's not enough funds. We all know that we all struggle in uh, in different ways, and each community has their own struggles. Um, so I just want to say, you know, we, we during these even these harder times during COVID, you know, with uh, staying at home orders and you know, with this variant out there, you know, we're all doing our best to stay at home. And just like uh, it is a good topic to talk about housing, as most of us are, are working from home or we spend a lot of time at home. So if we're, without uh, talking too much more, we're going to go into our presentation here. Uh, hopefully it all works. And then I will share my screen. There we go. All right, as I said, I'm from Independent First Nations Alliance. Uh, we have communities with us our uh, Pekanjikum First Nation, Muskrat Dam. Kitchen and Mix of Big Inuit or Big Trout Lake, Laxville First Nation and White Sands. And those are the communities that we service. And of course we do house inspections, code compliance inspections with all of our staff at uh, our technical unit. Um, so what I wanted to talk about, I've been talking about for those who've been following the conference over the past three, four years, I've been presenting on various aspects of the housing program, the housing inspection. I talked about uh, code compliance inspections. I talked about housing assessments. We're gonna talk a little bit about just uh, reevaluating some housing assessments, talking about what to do, how to use them, how to go about doing the inspections. And at the end, we're just gonna come together and talk about a community housing plan and we're not gonna to get too much into how it's gonna look because there's many variations out there and programs that we can use. So we're just gonna talk about the process and how to get to have your community uh, housing plan. So first of all, some of the things that uh, we want I wanna talk about is, you know, we're all gonna become housing inspectors. We're thrown into the role, whether we're a housing manager a site foreman, or we're working for a tribal council or, or a large First Nation, we do some level of house inspections, existing home inspections. Uh, we call them like a virtual inspection. So here are just some of the things and qualifications and training that uh, I've taken over the years, just 
national build uh, national building code training, the Ontario building code training. Uh, very tough courses when you get into very technical. Uh, the preferred method is that you go to college, uh, you get a civil architectural type background, and then you can start taking those courses and you need to pass the tests. And then you need to have so many before you can be somewhat called building code certified or in municipalities that you can become a municipal inspector. Uh, also, you know, there's, uh, you can take training through the Humber College. You know, CMHC has uh, provided training over the years, different types. It's not as good as it used to be. You know, I, when I first started out, uh, you know, 20 something years ago, there was lots of training available. So, you know, maybe it's a good time for some of that training to come back because I find there's a lot of young people, a lot of young professionals, and we just don't have those training dollars available anymore. So that would be a good thing, you know, for if there's any uh, funders listening to my presentation. We always need dollars for training. Uh, there, there's many different things. Uh, just like uh, you're building a house, there's 16 divisions in construction. There are many different areas that you could be uh, inspected. And I just wanted to list the wet, you know, it's not your wet, but the wood energy technical, that's a wood stove certification. Uh, wood burning appliances and that's one also that where you would have to be certified in if you want to start looking at wood stoves and a lot of First Nations in northern Ontario here and I'm sure a lot of the remote communities across Canada wood is a good source of heating your home you know it's readily available lots of trees so installing a proper making sure it's operating proper I would encourage you uh, some of the other provinces, you may have different certifications, different things, but it's all pertaining to wood stoves. And uh, you just want to make sure that you get some of that training if you're going to start doing uh, existing home assessments or new compliance inspections. Just some uh, thoughts there. I am going to try to watch my time. I'm already uh, into 10 minutes, so we'll, uh, we'll move along here. Okay, so a housing assessment. Housing assessment, it's a conditional assessment. You know, you, you're gonna do a visual. Very rarely do you do like that guy on TV, uh, when he was there about 10 years ago, he would tear about the house, tear it apart and say it's no good. We're not, we don't do that, that's not realistic. We don't have that kind of budget when we talk about wanting to do an assessment. This particular uh, home, that if you can see the picture there, this one, uh, was almost a full renovation right from the interior basement all the way up to the roof and you could see in this picture here you could see that the vapor barrier wasn't continuous and you can see some of this uh, uh, where the air movement goes and it leaves the moisture on the wood so you can see that you kind of started to have some of that stuff that we don't like to see in housing is that we there's some evidence of some type of mold growing here right so you want to make sure that you are capturing uh, when you go out and do your assessments in your communities, you do want to make sure that you are looking at the house as a whole and you're doing a visual inspection. And you let people know that, that this is a visual inspection because you're not going to be able to tear open walls and stuff like this. This is after, if, if it becomes a project and you renovate it. So it's a condition of the unit. Okay. So when you're doing the assessment, you wanna make sure you have the right data or you're collecting the things. Here's just some size of the house. And uh, when I first started out doing inspections, I would carry my building code, I would carry whatever, just because when you first start out, you don't know all the codes, you don't know all the things that you need to look out for. So, you know, I encourage all you young people who are just starting out, you know, to take that documents with you when you go into the community. If you're staying away from home, you know, take a look at those codes at night, review your notes. Uh, you want to make sure that you get kind of a sketch. I always write a sketch of the house in, in my unit, whatever I'm looking at. You just want to make sure that you have your areas. You know, I always carry a book around and that you just want to make sure that you even do a simple floor plan of your uh, unit. So that way, when, you, when you're going back and you're writing your report, 
you have a visual aid of what you're doing. You want to look at uh, the last renovations it was. You want to look at what type of building services there are. And remote communities, some of the communities don't have a, a distribution uh, water network. So they're on truck haul. The water tanks are in the crawl space. Some of them are on grid power. Some of them are not diesel generator. So you want to make sure that you identify those services. And we can't, in, in communities, you can't always just assume what the house is being serviced by pipe water, pipe sewer, and power. And you want to identify those. You want to make sure that when you're doing your assessment, that you do it the same way. Make sure that you start, whether you like to start in the crawl space, basement, work your way up to the main floor, attic, and then you do the exterior. And I can't stress enough when you're doing your assessments that you take good notes. And whether it be in point form, in your book, or you're using your camera, you know, other years I talked about tools and assessments. We all use our phone now, but sometimes it's not that easy to get these pictures onto your laptop, into your uh, program that you're using. Some of you may be more advanced. There's tablets out there now. There's tablets that can be uh, used to do your presentation, you know, but the main thing about doing uh, these things, just like in many other tools, you have to do the inspection. You have to take the time to go to the house. You have to make the report. Okay, let's see how I'm doing here. Okay, so after you do your assessment, right, you usually if the homeowner is available, maybe now this time during COVID, you go outside, you do your six feet apart, and you do, and you ask the homeowner, how old is the home? You know, and you know that you can date your home. There's a few areas, right? There's the toilet, there's the windows, there's any appliances in the house. Those are some areas where if the homeowner doesn't know the year of the house, you can also look for those areas in the house to date your house. You wanna ask the homeowner if they did any renovations. Was there a permit? I know in First Nations, when we say permit, there's not a lot of First Nations that have permit, but did they let the band office know that they were gonna renovate and they did some electrical work? Did they know the band office or the administration office that some plumbing work you did on your own or the homeowner did on his own? So those are the kind of questions when you're doing your interview, you wanna ask that and then listen to them. You know, a lot of people know the ins and outs, they know the creaks and sounds of their home. So talk to them about that. Okay, so here's your assessment. Here's just some high level health and safety items. You know, I can't stress enough. You know, we, we hear of uh, across the country of uh, house fires and people passing away, you know, very tragic. Um, and it all could become that, uh, you know, the firefighters advertisement, smoke alarms, what do they say? Working smoke alarms save lives. So as a building inspector, or as someone doing a house assessment, make sure that the smoke alarms are working. You know, if you're not tall, you know, I'm about 6'3", if you can't reach it, get a step stool, part of your tools of doing an assessment, a ladder, test the smoke alarm. And look into the building code, just highlight one per floor, one per bedroom, that's the new code. Older homes, as long as there's one per floor, you know, just make sure that you're reviewing. The main thing is that you have operable smoke alarms. You wanna look for exposed wiring. You wanna make sure ramps and high handrails are there. You wanna make sure uh, things like an exit door, a second exit door, it's not a code thing, but it's kind of a best practice thing for health and safety. Check the plumbing. You know, then you wanna make sure that you also have your detailed scope of work, going back to your notebook making sure that you write notes because for us that work in also remote First Nations, just to fly up north, you know, it's $2,000. So you wanna make sure you capture all the information, get that detailed information so that you can either have a contractor or the housing department complete the assessment. It's very important. When you write that uh, work description, it's like a scope of work for a contractor so that they can bid the work or that the housing manager has some tools in him so that he can help direct the housing crew in the community to 
to complete the work. Okay, so we, we talked uh, about housing assessments. So now your assessment's complete, you finished it. It's ready for renovations. You can use this report. Uh, it's a future planning tool if you don't end up renovating the house, but you can uh, incorporate it into your housing plan. You can, uh, I would say that depending on the size of the community and who's doing your inspections, come up with a plan to reassess your home. Every year, if you have a small home like some First Nations where there may be only 32 houses, it's very easy for an individual to re-inspect those houses each year. If you have a larger First Nation, you know, like, you know, the Mohawks, you have multiple inspections or one of our communities where there's like 450 homes, you have to put some kind of a schedule to re-inspect those homes every two to three years. You know, don't, don't, uh, don't use too much data if you're gonna be applying for say a CMHC RAP program or an ISC renovation program, you might have to go out and re-verify that house inspection report because something may have changed in that house. The individual may have uh, renovated and put a new wood stove in or who knows what it is, right? So you just wanna make sure that your current uh, data is, is, uh, is there. So what I wanna show you briefly is I'm just going to show you an ex, uh, inspection report, the one that we kind of use. I have shared this maybe with some of some people are listening. I just want to ask my uh, facilitator, can you see the inspection report, Morgan? Okay. So this is one that we use when we go out and do an inspection. So we're at uh, over here, we're at ABC First Nation, we're at 123 Main Road. So you wanna make sure you can put in the weather. So you can put in all these different things, type of building, duplex, uh, services. Remember we talked about services here, uh, truck haul, water systems. And then one of the things that we, that uh, getting in some information, the demographics or the, the, the people the, who live in the home, is there someone with a di disability? someone in a wheelchair, someone who's blind, because when you go for those uh, renovation programs, sometimes you can get more dollars or that individual needs certain types of renovations. Uh, it just reminds me of a presenter who presented uh, about two years ago at a housing conference on people with disabilities. There are building materials out there and there are construction methods out there to make it easier for the occupant to live in the home. And there's some standards out there so you wanna make sure that when you're doing your inspection, you're finding out who's living in the home. Do they have any disabilities? And then the other thing that I wanna get into here to talk about is you wanna to try to get a capture of the, the male and females in the home and the age of them. And especially when we talk about First Nations and how there's a lot of overcrowding, there's two, three families living in one home. So you, if you can get some of this information here, you can start to identify how many houses in your community have overcrowding. And then we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. So that's just uh, what we start out. And then we get into the inspection. We broke out the inspection into areas, exterior, the kitchen. You can put in the size of the kitchen here. And then we put it as a rating system, good, not available, poor, because, and then when there's a deficiency or when there's something wrong or health and safety item, you can put it right there when there's something missing. So this is how we do it. So a lot of the times, depending how you wanna do it, I know that we talked about different methods. A lot of companies out there or other organizations are starting to put this into a tablet format. But one thing about thing is that you have to make sure you stay current with your software and you have to keep usually renewing the license. So what, we, what we've been doing at IFNA now, we've been using just an Excel base because a lot of communities are using that Excel program and it's very easy for people. We can train them on how to use it. We can show uh, people how to fill out the forms. 
And uh, so this is what we're using right now in our communities. And I shared this with some of the presenters over the years. And this is what we're still using when we do existing home inspections in our communities. So we break it up for bedroom. And then just like what all of us see, we're very visual. You can attach pictures in here of the home. You can show the different angles. You always want to make sure you get uh, the two corners of the home. You can see right here so that you can see all four size at a minimum and then take some more pictures of things that are usually wrong. <laughs> Depending on the pictures you take, it, it, I find people you take pictures of everything or you take pictures of deficiencies only because you want to make sure you're uh, utilizing your time and you're not confusing yourself after and you're looking at all your pictures in detail. So learn your process like I talked earlier if you're starting from the foundation to the basement. Learn that if you only take pictures of deficiencies when you're reviewing your 30 or 40 photographs you know that there's something wrong in that picture. Okay. And then after we did, we went through all our notes, we took our pictures, and then we start putting a budget. Because a lot of the times, uh, this helps out uh, the community and helps out the housing manager to create their work plan. They can see, okay, we got to repair the bathroom fan. The estimate is $250. These are just estimates here. And they're, they're, they're all fillable. You punch in the, the amount at each line. You know, my, my the staff that I work with, they did all this very tedious work, making all these Excel sheets add up and everything. Uh, very good on them, you know. I'm uh, just uh, very proud of my staff that work at IFNA. They, they do a, a good job looking after the housing. Um, so then at the bottom of it, we have a summary here. So as we went through the report, you can see that right here on the side. Maybe I'll uh, zoom in a little bit here. You can see that you can have an estimate, a summary of where you got to put your dollars to for each area of the home. Uh, this is very detailed. Um, and then what you can do with this form, it's ready for any uh, funding, uh, it's ready for any funding submission with some reformatting. Copy and paste, you can put it into a wrap worksheet, you can put it into an ISC or even a, a, a Ontario program if they ever give us any funding. So that's, uh, that's the report. So then now that you say you have your community and you went and did all the inspections, you went and did all the inspections and now you're, you put them all in there and now you can come up with a kind of an overall budget or an overall plan because you have the demographics. So, and then you can also talk about, you know, here's, this is an Excel sheet. I just kind of wanted to show, you know, you can set up a table like this and this could be your overall houses that have been inspected and you take out and you link each report and then you can have a list of your overall budget. So this First Nation here, it's hard to see here. I'll go to the Excel sheet here in a minute, but you have $487,000 of renovations. So each one of these line items is a house. Oh, I went back too far. I'm gonna minimize this again. And I'm gonna show you where we have the assessment. So here we go. So here's a First Nation. We did all the inspections. Are we still good, Morgan? Are we still good? Okay. So here's, and here's some of the information that we talked about for the house, the, the type, number of bedrooms, number of occupants. So you look at the National Building Code, you look at this one, there's 13 people living in this house and it's only a three bedroom house. So, you can flag this as red. You can flag uh, these just, you know, that's why I like Excel because it's so easy. You can flag it and you can say that yellow is a house with overcrowding. 
And you can look at it, some other bedroom. Well, this one only has two occupants and you have three bedrooms. And then you can highlight this a different color and say, oh yeah, green, green is good. So there's many ways that you guys can do it. And when, when you get into your housing assessments and you get into the community planning, this is where you can start manipulating, not manipulating, using the data to create your housing plan. And you can say, you know what? ISC, based on our, uh, our uh, housing uh, funding, we're gonna get $300,000 this year for housing. And look at our houses. We need next year in renovations, we did our 31 inspections. We need $487,000 for next year. We're 187,000 short. So this is how you can start when you have the inspections and you have all the report, you can do some uh, long-term planning. And then you can break out this information in many ways. There's no right way or wrong way. Like say, let's say we wanna do the elders. So out of these homes, we know that there's elders homes in here. So the elders need renovations. You can break that out and just do a renovation. The elders homes, they need $185,000. And these, the linkages are all not working here, but you can click on this unit and then you go back to that inspection report. The one that I showed you, you could click on that unit and you can pull up that inspection report again. They can say, okay, so we're gonna go back and say, well, which house is that? You can say, well, the elders units is this house and you can go to the pictures. This is one of the elders units. So you can see that type of planning and that type of visual, uh, whether you're working with chief and council and whether or not you're working with uh, just the housing department, you have a planning tool here. So I see that I'm right at the 2.30 now. I'm just gonna go on for a couple more minutes. Um, I was told I can maybe go to 2.35 um, and I'm gonna go back to my presentation. So here's another thing. Uh, remember, we were looking at the thing. You can pull up any of the units and make these sheets. And you can say, oh, these are all the number of houses that were assessed. And you can even break it out into percentages. How much health and safety units are there? Health and safety repairs. Well, if we only have, say you only have 50,000 for the year. And you say, but I want to make sure that our community members are safe and that there's gonna be no house fire this year. You can say, well, I'm, I'm gonna do $22,000 worth of renovations because of my assessment way, the way I do it, I know that smoke alarms and wood stove, fire protection stuff will be in there, okay? Um, going in further, let's see here. Oh, I'm not even showing you guys my, uh, you've seen the whole slide here, cheating, okay. So, and then you can break out this data into other ways and you can show it, uh, you can break it out in percentages. You could say how many homes, uh, you can say that there's 21 deficiencies in um, single family residences, the elders units had three. And talking about major minor renovations, you can set up your range based on the funding you have. Like a small first nation, a minor renovation could be zero to five thousand dollars, but if you're like another First Nation where you know there's you have six thousand people living on reserve, a minor renovation could be zero to twenty five thousand dollars. And then you got to talk about replacement too when you're talking about that. We all know that there's houses come at a point when you have to decide when are you going to stop renovating, or when are you not going to renovate that house. Is it 100,000, 150? You know, a house package, three bungalow package now, let's just say 2020, a house package might've cost you $90,000. Now with COVID and I guess the tree stopped growing, you know, lumber is three times as much now. So it's gonna cost you $175,000 just to buy the lumber for the house. So that's why you have to stay on top of your housing plan and your, the, your partners that you work with so that you can plan your renovation costs. 
Because I'll tell you right now, that 300000 if you get last year, if you want to renovate 10 houses, that 300000 is not going to go as far because a two by four is $10, I heard this year. So last year was seven, six dollars for a two by four. This year it's ten dollars. So now you have to reevaluate your your uh, uh, your uh, what do you call it? Your estimates. Uh, so we're just talking about uh, housing planning. You want to make sure that you have your budget, renovation plan, health and safety items. And you can project that into a five-year plan. Some of you have done uh, community reporting. You can report up to five years. You can have your projections. If you know you're gonna get 300, good thing INAC doesn't increase our funding. Uh, so you can plan that you get that 300,000 for the next five years and what you're gonna renovate with that money, okay? Keep your house plan up to date, making sure your material cost, your labor cost, um, okay, so I'm trying to uh, stay on track here. I'm gonna say close this, minimize this, stop sharing. There you go. Well, that's just a, a quick overview. Um, I could probably share examples of that housing plan that I had. It's just a simple Excel. Uh, program that we made. I shared the assessments. I've been talking to everybody about doing this. I think I'm about a year behind of where I wanted to be with this, but it just gives you guys a tool out there that you can use. And what we'll probably do is put it on the community, uh, our community conference app or whatever, and then we can share it with you. I'll have to clean it up a bit just to take out some names and numbers, but the formulas works. And at least you can see the format there. So yeah. So I don't know if anyone has any questions, but sure. uh, yeah, no questions have been asked, but yeah, a lot of people have been asking for your uh, spreadsheet. So that's good. I will uh, head to the preset questions. What type of funding can inspection reports be used for? So the in inspection reports that we use, a lot of the times our, our big uh, applications are the C meet C wrap program. And whether that be the disability or regular wrap, but pretty much the way we laid out our inspection report, you can, like I said in the presentation, you can format it for any kind of a application out there. And the key thing I always find is that if you have these inspection reports, if you're kind of doing it and maintaining it, it's easier if you have to just do a recap on the inspection and you can get that report out sooner because a lot of times there's a deadline and we're all busy doing many things. We all wear different types of technical hats in our organization. So that's the thing about uh, having these assessments done and completed. So to answer your question, if you're using our format, you can almost use this for any kind of application out there just with some little uh, the copy and pasting and making sure it fits the right format. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, on to the second question. What are renovations costs based on? So based on your community and how you do it, um, we generally based renovation costs on materials. So usually we'll take, uh, say the average of last year's material cost. We'll use uh, three or four samples and we, we, you know, we'll take an average cost of the two by fours insulation. Uh, we break down the window cost to an area. Typically say a window package, you know, it all costs around, depending on how big your house is, $78,000. So you can break that down into a square footage. So when you're doing an estimate, we all know that windows are three by four, two by two, the average sizes. So you can say, you know what, we'll estimate that that house needs 60,000. Labor cost is generally based on how you're gonna do the renovations. If you're gonna do it as a community program, your own staff, whatever the salary or the hourly pay, you can break out your uh, labor cost as how much you're gonna pay your guys. And if you're gonna use a contractor's price, you wanna kind of do some research in your local area of what type of contract price you have gotten in the past or 
you can reach out in, uh, to the lo local carpenters union, seeing what the rates are for each thing, but that gets a little more technical. I would try to use existing data, uh, other projects that happen in your community, and then you can kind of break it out. Um, but generally you wanna keep your estimates up to date year by year. As you know, like I said this year, material prices, uh, supply and demand going through COVID. So material prices are high. And then even delays now with materials, just manufacturers been operating at 30, 40% capacity. So there's just that much more time to get the materials out to us. So, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I think that answers that. I got a question from Melanie Taylor. Is there a preferred season to conduct the inspections? Usually no snow. So inspections are best uh, when the snow melts. Uh, it's also a good time, you know, if there's going to be any flooding in the house, uh, when, the when the ground is thaws out, when the groundwater is moving, a good time is uh, once the ground is thawed out, that's a good time to do inspections uh, as there could be any leaks. Um, also, you know, going right throughout the summer into the fall is good. If you have to do inspections uh, during the winter, just make note of those conditions. It's just like you said, a visual inspection. If you can't see an area, make note of it in your report. Going back to the inspection report we're looking at, if you can't see it, just make a note of it. It was snowing, there was snow on the ground, should be recommended for reinspection during uh, the spring or summer. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for just one more question, I guess. How often should you complete housing assessments? So I think uh, I was talking about completing housing assessments uh, in your community based on the size, but generally every two to three years is a good turnaround cycle. Now to do a house assess assessment, if you're just getting into it, it takes you about four to six hours if you're going to do the method that we've been talking about going to the community looking at the house making your notes pictures and then you make a report it takes about when you first start out four to six hours as you get better then it uh, reduces that time so if you're the housing manager in the community and you have say 300 homes in your community you want to be looking at doing a house every two to three days to keep your housing inspections current to do your assessment. And then of course, you're just taking, you can actually take back the old assessment. Let's say this is our report, take this report back with you, and then you can just update any new changes in that house, any new pictures to update that report. So, cause like I said, it is current, you know, the data is only good as how relevant it is. You can't be using five-year-old data or 10-year-old data. So it, it, it does take work to uh, maintain your housing assessments, which upkeeps your community housing plan. All right. Yeah, that's it for questions. Um, okay, so well, what do we go to, 244? No, 245, right? Yeah, four minutes short. Four minutes short, four minutes short. So, Joe, here, I'm going to share my screen. Just go back to this uh, thing here. Another, uh, when we were talking about making the housing assessments, you can also break out your assessments and percentages. You can say that, okay, well, out of all the houses we inspected, uh, out of the, all the costs of the renovation, say it's 400 and something thousand, 32% of it is minor repairs. Or we can say that health and safety, out of our, what did we say, 300,000 housing renovation budget, 37% of that for this year should go towards health and safety. Because a lot of the times, I think when we're talking about housing and renovating, if you don't have that data, there's a sense of panic. You feel that panic and saying, okay, well, whose host are we gonna assess? What should we assess? So that's why you work with your building inspector, you work with your housing department and you do these assessments and get this data. And it does take time. It does take a lot of time to do these assessments. 
and then you can break out all all the different types of uh, houses that need renovations. You can start playing with it and working with the data so that you're targeting funds. You can say, you know what? This year we're going to do lot 45 duplex. Next year we're going to do the triplex. So that's how you can start using that plan. And, and you know what a good thing is? It can tell the community that we have a plan and we're following the housing plan. We're following our community housing plan. plan. Yeah. So that's so just some of the some of the stuff that we're we're starting to do at IFNA. And you know, I encourage all the other tribal councils and stuff like that and other technical people to work with your housing managers and start to develop a plan. You know, a couple of years ago I talked about doing a housing assessment plan, getting out and doing the inspection report. So if you're starting from scratch. That's good. You can start somewhere. Start inspecting those units, collecting that data. Of course, you know, a lot of times those don't exist. And then we're scrambling to inspect 10 houses because funding's available. And we're scrambling to get those reports out at a certain deadline. So, so I guess just with that, you know, I just want to thank everyone. You know, thank everyone for listening in. I know this time. COVID is a hard time. A lot of us don't feel like sitting down for five, six hours a day listening to people talk. You know, you miss that networking, that communication, but we'll get there. And I just hope that we are back next year for 2022, as we will be, I think, going into our 20th year of this housing uh, conference. So it'll be a great year. And I hope that we're able to uh, see a lot of you out there. And uh, have some good uh, stories, some good networking. And I'm sure we'll be talking about COVID forever now. Yep. All right. At this time, I want to thank Jonathan for uh, speaking. He will be uh, receiving a First Nation print uh, done by Daryl Big George. We'll be sending that in the mail through him. And then if we get the tech team to put up the passport to prizes code. The code is house, so make sure you uh, write that down and don't forget it. And head over to the passport prizes tab and fill in the code. And also, I'd ask everyone to uh, scroll down to the bottom of the screen and uh, fill out the five question survey. And uh, to come back for three for powwow aerobics with Dallas Arkend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Miigwech. Thank you, John.